Good. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, so sorry about the delay. We were uh, uh, stuck with some small technical issues. A uh, few shout outs, but before we do that, who's been to Software Circus Meetup before? Who's not? High five the person next to you. I didn't say double high five. That was next. That's, okay, it doesn't matter. A uh, few shout outs before we get started. Um, you're going to be hearing uh, some technical talks later from Frank uh, and also Florian. Now, Frank specifically is working on a, a Cisco project involving Mesos. We want to give a big shout out to Jen Hollingsworth of Cisco Open Source. Hi, Jen. Woo. Good. Um, next up, who was at the Software Circus Conference? Okay, keep your hands up if you thought it was amazing. Exactly. So, um, we're coming back with a Software Circus Winter Wonderland. It's going to be a one-day conference in a beautiful church in Amsterdam. One day, one track. It's probably going to be free, but we're going to have limited places. We're just arranging the date right now, but it's going to be at the beginning of December. So, if you want to get involved in that, we're going to send out invitations to the Software Circus group first. So get them quick because we're going to leave it a couple of days and then send it to the rest of the world. And I think it's going to fill up really quickly. We don't have any details about the kind of speakers we're going to get yet, but you can assume that it's going to be similarly awesome to the, uh, the one we had in September. Um, last, if you're on the live stream, it's you, and you have a question, tweet it at Software Circus and we'll get to you. Uh, I don't know who's going to do that. I'll sit somewhere near the front and we'll figure that out somewhere. Um, Right, three speakers this evening. I'm not going to introduce them all now. I'm just going to get started. Big round of applause, please, for Jamie Dobson. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you everybody. It's very nice to uh, see you all. So my name's Jamie, as Mark said, and I work for a very nice company called Container Solutions. You're sat in its office. Uh, I'm not very good at doing like promoting the company. I'm pretty good at promoting myself, but I've got to learn how to change that into uh, promoting what we do. And we are doing some pretty cool stuff around open source, and that led to a bit of a philosophical discussion about um, uh, capitalism, post-capitalism. And I came to the conclusion that software was not only eating the world, but it was eating capital capitalism itself from the inside out. So if you're interested in that sort of philosophy and working on pretty cool projects, you're going to see one of them later, then come and speak to me later because we're always looking for people to team up with, whether uh, in commercial capacity or any other capacity. Right. That's like the company plug done. <laughs> right. What am I talking about? Oh yeah, capitalism, right. So I've got some notes uh, and I've got a whiteboard and I've got a few slides. So let me first tell you how this talk came about. So over the some, oh, I've got the spinning pizza of death. Have you got, ba <laughs> have you got battery, Mark? <laughs> battery? <laughs> Fucking Google Docs. Um, Um, don't, I, that, don't look, yeah, uh, 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 <laughs> uh, ah, uh, stop, uh, bring it out, uh, oh, what slide two, oh yeah, that one, fuck, I've got my slides the wrong way around, I'm going to have to change the way I do this opening now, okay, over the summer, I was reading a lot about, uh, so who's an economist, economist, anybody, okay, yes, because I'm really scared of getting fact-checked by somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. Uh, and the last time I did this talk, there was somebody in the room who actually knew what they were talking about, and that made me very nervous. The other thing that makes me very nervous are live streams. I don't like them, because I tend to say what I like. Uh, and I always treat like the people I'm in a room with, you know, this is a private conversation, there's context and all that stuff. So I'm just going to try to ignore the cameras. Um, so over summer, I was reading about capitalism, uh, open source software in particular, which I'm interested in, and I stumbled upon a book called Post-Capitalism by an author called Paul Mason. And I read it, and I found it very interesting, and I started to make some notes. And then after that, I started reading about um, 
zero marginal costs. What happens when the cost to produce a new unit is zero or close to zero? You know, so when you build a car, to build another car, you need materials, power, and you need to, to distribute it somewhere. To distribute in economics, they call it the last mile. How do you get it from the man place of manufacture to the place you want to sell it? That led me to a book by a guy called Jeremy Rifkin. And I was reading that, and then I was trying to summarize this, these thoughts into an essay. Now, the essay ended up going on the news stack, and I ended up reaching out to this guy, Paul Mason, who works for Channel 4, and he writes for The Guardian. He's a really nice guy, actually. And I asked him to check a couple of things that he did. So I was like, wow, this is cool. I'm sort of on Twitter, DMing, you know, DMing him, DMing him, direct messaging him. And we're putting this together, this, you know, I'm putting together this essay, 140 characters at a time. Uh, so that, <laughs> that was a really nice experience. I didn't think it would go anywhere. That was two weeks ago. But then I was at a conference when I was doing this, and they said to me, hey, uh, somebody's sick. Can you speak? Now, they said to me, we're looking for a controversial, entertaining, and engaging speaker. Now, they couldn't find one, so they asked me. Uh, <laughs> So I said, okay, I'll do it. And then I pulled together uh, some notes and then I gave the talk and it was quite well received. So I've tried to tidy it up a little bit for you today. After the essay was published on the news stack, I received plenty of abuse on Twitter. I was a hypocrite. I was pushing a political agenda, things like this. Um, Twitter is a bit like that, isn't it? Twitter's, they say Twitter's like a market square, you know, where people chit chat and listen, eavesdrop on conversations and join in. Well, where I'm from, on our market square, if you abuse somebody as you get abused on Twitter, you know, you get punched in the face. <laughs> so uh, I don't know about Twitter. I don't know how long it's going to last, and I'm not sure uh, of its relevance as a platform. Now, with that in mind, you can get me at, at Jamie Dobson uh, <laughs> at, at twitter.com where <laughs> you can feel free to abuse me uh, if you like or ask questions. This is specifically for the people on the live stream. If you've got any questions about tonight, uh, Tweet me or tweet at Software Circus and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. Okay, uh, acknowledgement. The books, very good books. I thoroughly recommend them. You can read them in either order uh, and they're very interesting. Without any more messing about, I want to go straight into this talk now. So, who knows who David Ricardo is? Oh, okay, a few people. Who knows what Ricardo's magic trick is? I bet you do when I do it. Uh, I'm going to show you Ricardo's magic trick. And they say that it's the most counterintuitive truth of the social sciences. Uh, I believe that to be true. And it's very important as we move through these slides tonight and this talk tonight that we remember Ricardo. Okay, volunteers, I only need your names. Anybody want to? How do you, what's your name? Constantine. Constantine. Okay, anybody with a name I can spell? Uh, Mark and Alex, sorry. Constantine with a K? Okay, I'll, mm. nice name by the way. Um, uh, Emperor Constantine, responsible for the rise of the Christian Empire. Okay, just a bit of historical trivia for you there. Uh, does anybody know why Constantine gave birth to Christianity? Anybody? What? He won a battle. He won a battle? I thought he was dying. Oh, okay. I've been, I know less about history than I do economics. Um, okay, Mark and Alex. So this is Ricardo's magic trick. So let's say Mark takes three units of work to make a loaf of bread. So we can visualize that as three of these things. And what we can say is, you know, that gives us a loaf of bread. It takes Mark four units of work to brew one gallon of beer, which I can visualize as a database, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, as a pint of Guinness. <laughs> so <laughs> Alex, however, it's is... It <laughs> thank you, thank you. Alex, however, he's quicker. He can build, build, he can bake his bread in two units of work, and actually he can um, brew his gallon of beer in three. Now, this is where I start to pray, not to the demo gods, but to the gods of my mathematics. And I, f I keep my fingers crossed that I've got this right. So in total, we can produce two loaves of bread uh, and two gallons of Guinness. That's to say we can produce all the services and goods that this population of two needs. Right? They need more beer than they need bread. Uh, so the resulting output will be two gallons of beer, two loaves of bread. And the amount of work is three, seven... Uh, plus 
five, given a grand total of, uh, no, I'm kidding, 12. Uh, <laughs> right. Now, what happens, what Ricardo's magic trick tells us is that whatever you're best at, you should focus on. So in this case, Alex is better, uh, not that then they'd both make bread. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. This one? Okay, thanks. <laughs> so, <laughs> turns out, so Alex, it's, so the Ricardo's magic trick, you should stick to what you do best. So in this case, Alex uh, should make the bread and Mark should uh, make the beer, right? And if Alex goes ahead and makes bread for himself, that's two. And then he makes the bread for Mark. So we get, still get two loaves. And then Mark makes the, <laughs> the beer. Three. And then makes another three, we get all the goods and services that this population needs for some grand total of four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yay, it worked. Ricardo's magic trick. It's counterintuitive. When I first read about it, I opened up a spreadsheet and started putting numbers in to see what happens if there's three people and four people, and it holds all the time. The difference, which is two units of work, there's a name for that in economics. Does anybody know what it's called? No, no, no. <laughs> There's a technical term for that number. Anybody want to take a guess? Utility. That might be the technical term, <laughs> but I don't know if that's true or not. It's called prosperity. That's what prosperity is. And when I do economics, I cannot do it in the large. I can't do it. I can't think of the whole society. So I think about myself and my wife and the division of labour in our house. I think about what she's good at, what I'm good at, and I think about what happens when she's not there. <coughs> and when we're both there... The kids are in bed. Yeah, I've got two children. Fucking hate them. Oh, uh, no, no, that was a joke. Uh, so, the I think of prosperity as when everybody's in bed at seven o'clock, and me and my missus are watching, you know, CSI Miami or whatever it is we're doing. So I think the first division of labour was sexual. You know, men were good, good at some things, women were good at other things, and basically, once we started specialising, you start to get this ball rolling of mass specialization and basically mass prosperity. This is important when you look at what happens when we start to specialize in things like open source software, 3D printing and different forms of creating energy. So this is a windmill. Uh, it's in Yorkshire. It's one of the oldest windmills that's left standing. And something very interesting happened. Uh, I'll check my notes. It was around the... Um, so in the, the 12th century, 1185. So up until this point, power was provided by animals, human beings, beans, and mainly uh, water power. So people who had streams would put a water mill there and they would generate a form of power which would make it easier to produce the goods and services that society needed. The first water mills were used to thump uh, wool, right? Wool these processing, they put these, then these two arms, and they put these big paddings on, and the wool would go underneath in some water, and as the wind, windmill, excuse me, the water mill turned, it would thump the wool, and then you could start to produce uh, the goods and services you needed for society. But who had access to the water? Anybody take a guess? Landlords, landlords had access to the water. So basically, if you own land and the stream on it, the power is yours. So you could basically hold that power and then use it as a form of blackmail to the people who paid you regular rent. So we see the landlord as rent seekers. But then what happened? The windmill. And windmills can be put anywhere because there's windies everywhere. So what people started to do was build windmills, put them next to the, you know, in the village, and then they would put a workshop next to it. And so now they had free power, where previously they had to pay rent for it. And what did they do is they started to produce their own goods, which they could then trade within the local economy, in the village, and of course through further trading lines. They say the windmill was the, was, the, was, the, was the cause of the first great industrial revolution in the United Kingdom. And before, uh, in the blink of an eye actually, that spread throughout the UK, it wasn't called the UK back then by the way, 
Uh, they spread throughout uh, Britain, England, and right throughout Europe. And so this was the great d democratizer. What did the poor landlord do? Uh, I don't know. Does anybody care? Uh, what's this got to do with software? Vendor-specific software is like, the, is like power. People hold on to software, closed software, and they overcharge for it. They, uh, they don't trade it, certainly. Create a monopoly. What's happening now in the open source world is that we're able to produce our own uh, software and share it because we have so much access to these tools uh, and free stuff that's out there. So I think the, the day of the big software vendor uh, is over. People are starting to become self-sufficient. So I wanted to give this as an example. You're going to hear more about this from, uh, uh, from Frank later. This is the Elastic Search Framework for Mesos. So it's based on Elastic, of course, and it runs on top of Mesos. Now, what I would say is that small teams are able to do more now than big teams or even large corporations could do 10 years ago. So there's a great leap in productivity as we become more and more specialised, but also as we capture more of our labour into software. So if we come back to uh, capitalism, what you see is that you've got costs, uh, prices, and the price minus cost uh, equals profit. What all capital owners have always done is try to reduce their costs. One of the largest costs has, ho has always been labour costs. So the two ways that you usually address that are innovation, so that's automation typically. So with the thing that, you know, did the, the, um, uh, the windmill that did the, the pumping of the wool, the spinning jenny, computers in our times, everything is a way to automate uh, labour intensive processes. What that does is move your costs over to uh, capital. What that means is when you have a factory, as time passes, every new thing you build has costs, energy, uh, labour costs, right? However, when you automate something in a robot, you move the cost from running costs into the costs of capital. The other way to reduce your wage bill is to attack labour directly, to attack, to to attack unions, uh, to regulate, to lobby governments. But something really weird happens because the large part of this costs is wages, and this is the capital capitalist cycle. We create goods and services, and through Ricardo's magic, we create more goods and services uh, than ever before. And then we have to sell them to somebody. And the people we sell them to are the people who help build the goods and services. Henry Ford knew this very well. Uh, Ford wanted to pay a good wage and he reduced the working hour from you know, nine hours a day to eight hours a day and I think they had weekends. So people had the money to go and buy his car. And you, you very rarely see this capitalist cycle in such a small uh, micro, micro chasm. Micro chasm? Mi Cosm. Cosm, thanks. What happens when nobody's earning any money? What happens if they succeed in automating absolutely everything and therefore reducing the, the running costs to almost zero or zero in some cases uh, and nobody's getting paid who's going to buy the products this is what Karl Marx called a fundamental contradiction of capitalism and he said it's such a contradiction that it will undermine the capitalism system and it will collapse in on itself so the reason I say that software is eating capitalism is because nobody's selling this stuff right so the cost of producing it is bore by somebody so somebody pays the cost of the original production but the cost of reproducing it is zero i can share this elastic search framework with you uh well actually you can download it from git you can run it and you can use it to build your your, your own infrastructure it's free right so what does that mean for the people making it? Where are they going to make their money? So it's free. All the, all the costs have gone in actual capital, the software, and the distribution costs are free. 
What happens when more software becomes free? You start to see recombinations of simple software into more complex software until you get to a point where you can visualize a whole cluster, horizontally scale it for free. Nobody could do this a decade ago. Nobody, no matter how much money they had. So to me, this is a little bit of a, uh, of a sea change. And it first occurred to me as I was reading these books and because I work so much in software. What does it mean for the business models of everybody who's building products right now in the container ecosystem if nobody's willing to pay? Mini Mesos, again, this will come up in Frank's talk. Mini Mesos is part of uh, an open source project called Mantle that's uh, funded by Cisco but has numerous contributors. Mini Mesos, it shouldn't really be called Mini because it's quite big and powerful too. You can spin up a new cluster with Zookeeper, with Marathon in milliseconds. Uh, this is also free and, we're, and that's getting given away to people who produce more free software. So you start to see when you get um, um, when you get Ricardo's magic trick, you start to be able to produce complex artifacts at a very, very, very low cost. And then when you've got a system where it gets given away for free, you start to erode the fundamental relationships of capitalism, which is uh, costs minus the price. Well, the price is zero. You can't have profit when you're selling things for zero. It doesn't, it doesn't work. There's another reason why uh, these systems are growing seemingly exponen exponentially in their complexity. It's about sex. So one of my favorite TED Talks was, is from a guy called Matt Ridley. He's an author. Uh, I met him once actually, which was, which was a very nice experience. I got him to sign a lot of books that I'd uh, taken with me. And he gives a talk about ideas meeting and mating. And um, what he says is that on the left-hand side, you have a hand axe from, I don't know when, 5000 BC. And on the right hand side, almost the same uh, shape is the computer mouse. So you see the idea that something fits in the palm of your hand has moved forward across time and has started to meet with other ideas. Plastics, telecommunications, electronics. And every time they bump into each other, they seem to procreate, seem to have sex. Right? The more free things that are out there having sex, the more complex recombinations you're going to get. And because we do not deal in the physical in software, we deal in the, eth what's that word, Mark? Ephemeral? 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 We, we deal in nothing. We deal in like, you know, zeros and ones. It's absolutely free to copy. So what happens when there's loads of free ideas moving around? And what happens when you've got the most powerful idea sharing and sort of communications network the, the, the human race has ever seen? The internet facilitating that. Now, for these ideas, it's good to have a matchmaker. So anybody who works in innovation, it's always good to have one or two pe people who travel around the different companies and picking up different ideas. And they say, oh, Frank, maybe you should meet uh, uh, Alex. You know, you guys would get along. You've been doing frameworks together. The internet's not like that. The internet literally kicks you up the ass. It says, get, get, get out of this. Get out of this laptop. Go into the real world. Go, mate, procreate, get married. Right? The internet is a pushy, pushy generator of ideas. So that's the real reason why I started to think, okay, capitalism has had its day. Because to so the three conclusions I came to, lots of software is free and it can be made into new value adding products. Ideas have always mated. They've always met and mated to produce more ideas. Right? But the, in the internet encourages ideas to be extremely promiscuous. Um, on top of that, there's more people than ever working on software products. So as well as there being this great matchmaker, the internet, there's more people than ever doing this. And on top of that, our education system now caters for programming, software development, design. So now we've gone from something that was a hobby in the 70s to something that's literally becoming part of our curricula at our school. And unlike physical goods, this is the kicker, unlike physical goods, once you've produced an artifact, a software artifact, it can be reproduced indefinitely. You don't, you know when you go to iTunes and you buy a song, you don't really think it costs 99p, do you? Or 99 cents? Who thinks it costs 99 cents? 
Hey? The, the What is the DRM system? Digital rights management system that prevents it from talking again to two different computers. Right, but the cost of it getting to you is not 99 cents, is it? Distribution. Yeah, and in fact, how much costs are built into that? Nothing. Once you have Beyonce's, you know, single ladies, you can get it to everybody for free. So the price you pay has got absolutely nothing to do with the cost of the underlying artifact, the cost of the manufacturing costs, the electricity, or anything like that. Okay, because this is really important, because when uh, the costs of things tend towards zero, then um, the profits start to tend towards zero, because people are not willing to pay for it. What happens to capitalism then? And when I first looked at all of this, my, my first thoughts were, of course, about software. But I started to read around a little bit Skype. Started to think about Skype. Why is Skype free? When I was a child, we could not use the phone. We had one of those big Baker-like phones, right? You had to turn it around like that. And if you got one of the numbers wrong, you had to start again, right? So you we didn't own the phone. The, the, the phone company owned the phone. You couldn't open the box. You couldn't change it. You couldn't even put a phone in your upstairs bedroom, right? Not that we, we had that. We were not that posh, right? If you wanted a phone upstairs, you'd say to the phone company, hey, I need an extra phone, and you'd have to give them a good reason, like you're a businessman, and you do some work in your bedroom and shit like that. <laughs> uh, Mind-boggling, right? You had to pay for that. I was not allowed to call my friends. My mum said, get out of the house, you know, go around and see them. Telecommunication costs have dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped, and now we have video conferencing for free. Now, something happened, right? At one point, we thought, hey, that internet thing looks like it's going to work. So what we need to do is put loads of cables between uh, Europe, actually I think it goes through Iceland. We need to put loads of cables all across through the Atlantic and then all in the Indian Ocean and all over the world. And people were betting big on this. People were chucking billions and billions of dollars worth of capital to put this infrastructure in on this promise that you know we would be able to make money with video conferencing and internet stuff just like the old telecommunications did. Boom, the market fell out and all the capitalists lost their money. It's like, oh no, poor capitalists, they lost their money. But there's always a downside to a big crash and there's always an upside. And the upside for us is free Skype. Because once the infrastructure is in place, once the capital's there, you don't have to pay to use it. The, the marginal costs are zero. It's the same when somebody runs a cafeteria or a pub, right? Somebody tries to do a new business, but it doesn't work. What happens at the end? They sell all the furniture off cheap. Yeah, bad for them, good for us. You know, because we needed some desk for, for the office. So capitalist failures, there's always somebody who wins, there's always somebody who loses. Zero marginal costs. 3D printing. Uh, once you've paid for the printer, most 3D printers use recycled uh, materials. I didn't know that. Um, so the cost of producing that bunny is almost zero. 3D printers now print themselves, did you know that? Mm -hmm. 3D printers, I've got this weird vision where I go to work and I come back and my 3D printer's printed itself. And it sat there looking all sheepish, thinking, I, 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 did, I didn't need to do it. I was like, what the, f printing yourself. Anyway, then I go back to work and then I come back and then there's four of them. <laughs> I'm like, guys, right, you've got to stop doing this. Um, printers can print themselves. But I did start to think, what happens if one of, the, one of the parts of the printer was broken? Then it couldn't print itself, right? So it has to preemptively print itself. Because it won't work if one of its own parts is broken. Then I have to go to my neighbour who's got the same model and say, can you print me that part again? Anywho, I thought 3D printers all look like that. But they don't. Because that's a Chinese 3D printer that prints houses. Right? I didn't know these things exist. It's a concrete house. It takes eight months, layer by layer. But if it takes eight months now, it's going to be a lot quicker in a few years. I've read, I don't know if it's true, that 3D printing, green energy, are all on a hockey stick curve, an exponential growth curve. The data, as far as I could figure out, looks correct over the last 30 years. I think the cost of a, a, a unit of energy from a solar cell was $60 in the 70s, and now it's $0.60. Cents. There's nothing to indicate that trend uh, is going to stop. 
So you can print uh, all kinds of things with 3D printers. And again, once you've invested in the capital, and once you've got your material, most of which is uh, like old wood or plastic, the cost of producing a new unit is very low, close to zero. Not zero, because you have to pay for the concrete, but very close. Because where's the labour? There is no labour, it's printing itself. Then who's going to buy the house? Nobody. Just going to sit there, idle, with all these people who used to have jobs working on building sites going, oh, that's a nice house. <laughs> it won't work. It won't work as a system. Who knows what that is? It's a power plant. But it's not a real one. It's what's called a backup plant. Um, backup plants are positioned all over our countries. And um, they... They only get switched on when, you know, more energy is needed. Winter time or changing the weather. So they fire them up to deal with spikes in demand. Right? However, in Germany, did you know that 25% of all electricity in Germany was produced by renewables or green energy last year? What that means is, when somebody tables this in the German government, don't know what it's called, the Bundes government, uh, <laughs> was that racist? Is that racist? No, no, this is German here. He said it's not racist. Okay. So, <laughs> did, did you know that you produce 25% of your energy from... Yeah. You knew, is it is common knowledge in Germany? Kind of common knowledge. So, when you go ahead and build a hugely capital intensive thing like a power plant or a factory uh, or a hotel for that matter, what you do is you do a prediction and then you look at the return on investment. So you think, well, you know, we're chucking a billion dollars uh, and, you know, it'll take us this long to get our money back and then, you know, we're quids in for at least the next three decades. Will there be a return on this investment? It turns out in Germany they're no longer building backup plants because they cannot justify the investment. So what's interesting to note is it didn't take... Um, the whole, you know, a, a full rollout of green energy to stop this happening, it just required a few percent changes in how energy was produced. These are now economically uh, unviable. There's another interesting fact you should know. Um, the Chinese produce more green energy than all of the power plants in Germany and France combined last year. So they could power half of Europe just on their renewables because of course one of the arguments I get back is oh how can cap capitalism will never completely die because you, you'll still have costs because of the energy costs but actually once you've bought a solar panel and stuck it on your roof the capital has been invested energy from then is free marginal cost is almost zero yeah. why not yeah. I'm, I'm guessing that that's already happened yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if people were 3D printing at least parts of... Uh, so there's a good story about 3D printing and how it, how it disrupts. My colleague Anthony, he works here, um, and there's a small piece of his uh, chain guard was broken. So he modelled it, he, he tried to get it sent off for a new part, and the manufacturer said, no, you can only buy the whole thing. So yeah, what he did is he printed one, fixed his bike, printed another one because his dad got the same bike, and then put the model online, and now everybody can print that bike part so all those stockpile chain guards you know what are they going to do if we can we can either print different parts or the whole thing at home um 29 that's another number i wrote down does anybody know what 29 is oh, well i mean anyone want to hazard a guess <laughs> as to why i wrote it down so i wouldn't forget prime eh? prime is it a prime number oh. Twenty-nine is the average number of hours adults work in the Netherlands. And it's not because, I mean, some people will be unemployed and looking for a job. Most of us are underemployed by choice. So this promise that innovation and capitalism would push us towards a life of leisure, in my opinion, is never more obvious than when you're in the Netherlands. Right? People are running in the park and walking their dogs. We do not have to work 40 hours anymore. And the thing about the 40-hour work week is that's a joke as well. That's a modern construction. 
people, our ancestors, only a few generations back, would have worked 60 hours a week, right? And on Saturday. They, Saturday was not a day off. So you could see we're working less and less and less. You have unemployment in the States and England right now. You have underemployment in the rich parts of Europe. You've got Google trucks that are about to start driving themselves. Surely this is coming in the next five or ten years. The number one occupation in 25 of the 52 states of the United States is truck driver. 25 states, half of them. And all of them have got auxiliary businesses around them. Cafeterias, warehouses. What happens if no drivers are eating? Caf cafeteria's gone. I think it spells an interesting uh, oh, pizza. Maybe it's my last slide. <coughs> oh, it's my last slide. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think in summary, the, the story of Anthony is really the most interesting story. It's not that we, it's not just that we are riding uh, Ricardo's magic, and we are finally sitting on more innovation than we've ever, ever sat on. But the generation that probably came just after me, I'm nearly 40, not only wants to create free things, it wants to give them away. So there's been a shift in mindset. Who owns a car in this room? Would you prefer to have your car or the internet? <laughs> internet. And so who would prefer internet over a car? Who prefers a car over the internet? Yeah, nobody. <laughs> if you ask our parents, what do you prefer? They all say car. And so what you see is a situation where our generation are more interested in access. We don't own the internet. We have no desire to own it. People are more interested in access than ownership. This is becoming obvious to uh, uh, other businesses. So, for example, General Motors has now built in carpooling into its software. So all new GM cars... I, uh, I've lost a sheet of paper. It doesn't matter, I can remember. All new GM cars come with software that allows you to easily share with another GM user. So let's say Yaroslav buys a GM and I've got a GM, but my, my wife's got mine. I can just say, hey, is there a car in the neighbourhood? It will say, oh, Yaroslav's not doing anything with his. And the CEO, Mary Barra, said, we're going to disrupt ourselves because if we don't do it, somebody else is. So when a car manufacturer is making it easy for you not to buy their product because you can share, then that says that you know, there's a shift in what we're doing. We're sharing toys, we're sharing uh, office spaces. And the most important thing to note is that you don't have to go 100% into this stuff. 20% change in demand, you know, 10% people start to share and 10% stop purchasing, that's enough to disrupt a whole industry. As soon as the, as soon as we got to 22% uh, e-books, that was the end of publishing two years ago. All the small publishing shops and bookshops, they just more or less vanished. As soon as you hit this number. And it was the same for the power stations in Germany. And I think we're on that cusp. I think we're on that cusp right now. And I find it a particularly exciting uh, time to live in because you almost see the change in front of you. That's it. I'll just finish with one thing. I saw The Matrix, one of my favourite films. Maybe you remember at the end, he calls the whole world, right? Because obviously they've got the internet in The Matrix. Free calls. Uh, <laughs> he calls the whole world and he says, I know you're scared. Um, you know, I know things are changing. Now I can't tell you what's going to happen in the future. That's a choice only you can make. And my hope is that we make good choices. That's it. Questions? Uh, you said that the, um, uh, the house is now being printed with the conference, so obviously you cannot remove it. You can re remove the price of the building the house, but not the price of producing the concrete. So what's going to happen with the industrial big scale production like steel and concrete and things like that that would fill these blocks of the things that we use to share? Can you repeat the question for the live stream? The question was, what happens to the industries like uh, steel and uh, what else? Concrete. concrete. concrete so I don't know. So I don't know anything about concrete, but I think it's cheap. 
I don't think I don't think steel steel you need to dig out the ground and you need to process and you need to roll it and you need to move it places. My understanding is that concrete is cheap, so I don't know if they're comparable, but I don't know. But obviously, if GM are producing cars that you can share, then the demand for more steel products is also going to fall. So I can imagine that we'll need there'll be less demand for things like steel. I also know that many 3D printers just use old materials. They just crunch it up and you know, you got you got you can there's a 3D printer where you can throw wood in and it just crunches it up and glues it back together and spits out artifacts. You've got this big comp like a uh, big bucket on the back of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that the, the, the lady at the back was adding, just for the benefit of the live stream, there are also advances in uh, materials, and we are now seeing uh, things created, you know, with different materials. Didn't they invent? I think it's called graphene in the University of, was it Manchester, in the north of England, um, and that's an extremely strong, extremely light, and I think ext extremely cheap material. Yeah. Don't you think that the same thing will happen then when, when you own a lot of the companies like Apple or Microsoft, Facebook, Google, they have all the capital, so they control at one point who gets what? I think there's a great battle underway. I think there's, a, there's a currently an epic battle between those who are interested in, in a shift back to a commons, a creative commons period. like. That we think capitalism is the way it has to be because it's all we understand. But actually, for most of the history of humanity, we just shared stuff. We lived together, we shared stuff. And writers never used to ask for payment because they thought that what was coming out of the pen was you know, divine inspiration and it was their duty to share it. Um, there's a huge battle because Apple, Google, all these people have got data, right? And that data can have an extremely important public function because if they've got data that can help create a healthier uh, society and they're not sharing it then what should we do what's the moral thing to do i don't know the answer to that question because some people will say well we earn that data with our capital investments and we should have the right to get the return on that and other people will say well it's not for the greater good that needs to be in the public domain and we think that's not possible but standard oil was a monopoly in the united states in the turn of the last century uh, and and the american government uh, nationalized it and broke it up now, not com didn't completely succeed, but they, there is a history of that when something gets too big, governments do intervene. Uh, but I think that battle is, is currently in progress, and that's why I say about choices, what do we want, to, what type of society do we want, and how do we want this to roll out? Because without public policy, we've got no chance. Unless this gets embedded into decision making and, and social policy, I think it's going to be a very uh, tough time really ahead. What do you do with underemployment? Look what's happening in Greece. So I think of my own life, when I was 18 and unemployed in Hull, I just got high and drank and bummed around. Now that I'm, I work in software in the Netherlands, I've got a bit of free time because I don't need to work full time. And I engage in the civil society. I do community work. I do a bit of teaching, whatever. And I think the two environments created a different response from me at different points in my life. So when you're in Denmark, you think, oh, yeah, they could cope with underemployment. But when you're in parts of England, you think, how are they going to cope with underemployment? And that's to do with the social structures and the way society is set up. The question is, who supports net neutrality when that was going on? Do you even know? OK, a few. Do you, does anybody, do you all know what net neutrality is? How did you support it? Did you retweet stuff? <laughs> you tell them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Alex? Ma Jamie, are you some kind of communist? And the question was, am I some sort of communist? <laughs> no, but you are. Yes, I am. <laughs> the question is... Well,
what, what are we to do as a society to, to the changes that we're facing? Okay, so the question is, what can we do to these changes that we're facing? Uh, I, I don't know. So, um, so if you look at what's happening in Greece and Spain and Portugal, you can see that's unsustainable when you've got a whole generation of people that are unemployed. But I do know that some things are happening. So something like 22% of all houses in the Netherlands, 22%, it can't be 22 as well, 20 something percent of all houses in the Netherlands are, are owned by housing associations. Uh, so you see that there is a sort of response. In the local park, to me, uh, they do making. So you can go there and make things. It's for free, it's for children. So I think, um, I once met the uh, sort of the head of the Poetry Society in the UK, and she said the recession was great for poetry because people were pissed off, fed up, and they couldn't find a job. So they started writing again. Uh, my, f my hope is that we'll find creative ways to work through all this stuff. And my fear is that we won't. But there is evidence that, of, you know, that it's working in some areas and it's not working in others. I was just going to, yeah, go on, question, yeah. Yeah, that's a question. Will travel and going to Disneyland become marginal? No. So not everything uh, of zero. Will the marginal cost become zero? Not everything will tend towards zero. I got a good question the last time I did this, and someone said, what about property in London? That'll never tend towards zero. <laughs> uh, and I had no comeback, except later on I was thinking, well, actually, actually, wait a minute, wait a minute. As we do more telecommunication, and clearly we're moving from uh, integrated hierarchies, the big companies, into you know networked horizontal ways of organising. Of course, if you do a horizontal sort of network, then you don't need to live in London because you don't need to be close to where you are because of all the free telcos. So then, what are you going to do? You move out. So I think there could be an equalisation in property prices. It'll never get towards zero. Uh, although, although the costs of living in a house are close to zero because the building has already been taken care of. So then you've just got your running expenses, your electricity, oh, that's going to be free in five years. Your phone, oh, that's already free. Your internet, that's going to be free in five years. That's my prediction. You, nobody will be paying for the internet in five years' time. Okay, then what have you got? Okay, you need to have a window cleaner. Oh, yeah, you've still got to pay him. Yeah, so a lot of the costs in your house are starting to drop. What happens if you start 3D printing? You know, knobs, you know, things like that. You know, bits of the house that need replacing. The cost of live music has gone up and the cost has plummeted. Now, I'll tell you a good story. I met Mark when we both presented for the English Breakfast radio show. And I like to believe that the reason we did it is because there's all these moaning English bastards who've gone about our shit Hollanders. And I'm like, you know, we don't all moan. Some of us love being here. So we did this radio show and we tried to explain what it's like living in the Netherlands. And I got to interview the Turin Breaks, which were a band out of London and at the Paradiso. And I said to him, hey, it's good to see you. You know, nice to be here. We really like your music. And they said, yeah, shit, all we're doing is gigging, you know? Oh, why is that? Can't make any money in CDs. And I was like, yeah, what a shame, right? Because you're talented musicians, people want to see you, right? So maybe it's a shame for them, but it's not a shame for the people. And you see that all over. People are not recording CDs, but rather they're traveling around and doing what they do, which is playing gigs. I think that's awesome. Any more questions? I'll just quickly answer that. Marta. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I don't think you don't have any thoughts about this. So, like, what do you do? Like, how is it going to help the future of the world? The so the question is for the stream. What are my thoughts about the future? So I'm an I'm probably an optimist. I think I think human beings are capable of the most wicked, wicked things, and that's especially true when we're disconnected. We become disconnected. We become wicked towards ourselves with self-destruction. Uh, and when, when there's, you know, 
there's study after study after study has shown when you focus on material things, money, progression, your compassion and empathy goes down. And I don't believe that we are unempath unempathic by nature because look at what we've created with, with Ricardo's magic trick. So my hope, and I'm praying, which for an atheist is a funny thing to do, <laughs> my, my hope is that the empathic you know, will win out. But you see battle lines being drawn. The extreme right gives ri rise to the extreme left. Uh, you see uh, Putin's intervention in Syria. It's all to do with you know, favours in the future because we'll still be fighting over oil. You see people still in denial of climate change. So you see the dark side of humanity and the light side. But nothing focuses the mind like deadlines uh, and we've got two massive problems. The planet is melting, right? It's going. The ice is melting. The topsoil is going, right? There's nothing left. We are using twice as much of the Earth's resources as we can as a sustainable, which means we're eating the principle as well as the interest. That's coming, right? Rising sea levels, blah, 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 blah. The other thing is people just won't fucking die. The old people won't die, right? And we've got to feed them and we've got to clothe them and so we should. We have an aging demo demography. Demography? Demographic. I need to practice my words more. We've got an aging population. What are we going to do about that? Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. So the goal of container solutions is to learn how to do IoT, microservices and big data really well so we can apply it to something that's useful, solving these big problems. And as a capitalist, I'll make loads of money doing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a joke. That was a joke. Any more? Any more? Thanks for listening. I, I lost track of myself somewhere in the middle, so I hope it was a bit coherent and uh, it's been a bit of a long day, but thank you.